This is a day the Lord has made. I want to welcome you to worship here at Gloria Day on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Can you believe Christmas is just one week away? Boy. Yeah. And what beautiful weather we have today. A three-year-old boy arranged a wooden nativity scene and then called his grandmother in to take a look at it. The grandma said, I see the baby Jesus, and I see Mary, and I don't see his daddy, Joseph. Oh, that's because he's at work. <laughs> Story has it that Mary and Joseph went to all the inns in Bethlehem, but as the scriptures tell us, all of them were full. Finally, Joseph begged one innkeeper, please, we must find shelter. My wife is about to deliver a baby. The uh, callous innkeeper replied, well, that's not my fault. To which jo Joseph replied, it's not mine either. <laughs> Let's take a moment to turn to our neighbor to our left and right, tell them how glad we are that they're here today. will be gathering in the foyer and out on the patio, and we hope that you can stick around and share how God has been active in your life. Uh, right now, I'm going to invite the Boyer family to come up and to lead us in the lighting of the Advent wreath. I apologize. You don't want to use your bulletin for the opening litany. You want to use the screen, because it's all kind of all over the page, but uh, it'll all make sense as we get to the prayer. Good morning. Good morning. A wisdom who proceeds from the mouth of the Most High, reaching from beginning to end, mightily and sweetly, ordering all things. Come and teach us the way of prudence. O root of Jesse, emblem of the people, before whom kings keep silent, to whom nations pray. Come deliver us, not delay. O rising sun, splendor of eternal light and sun of justice. Come and lighten those who sit in darkness. O ruler of nations, the desired of all, the cornerstone that unites. Come and save the people you created out of the clay. O Emmanuel, our ruler and lawgiver, the expectation and savior of the nations. Come and save us, O Let us pray. Praise, Praise to you, O God, who lives with us, sharing our flesh and bones. As Mary waited and Joseph dreamed, so we wait and dream for you. Bless us and let your face shine upon us, more radiant than these candles and more dear than all else we seek. Restore us when we fail to refuse the evil and choose the good and banish all our fears. We pray in the name of Emmanuel, your promised child and our Savior. Amen. Please rise for the opening hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning. Making sure they're all away for you. Wow. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. Um, the first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Uh, a brief uh, introduction. An Israelite and Aramean military coalition presented a serious threat to King Ahaz of Judah. In response, Ahaz decided to secure his throne and kingdom by seeking Assyrian help. Isaiah reminds Ahaz that human attempts to establish security will fail. The prophet gives a sign that is the only source of true safety. Emmanuel, God is with us. And now the reading. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. 
But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Here ends the reading. second reading comes from the book of Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 7. Most of the Christians in Rome do not know Paul. In this letter's opening he introduces himself as an apostle divinely appointed to spread God's gospel. The gospel's content is the promised coming of Christ and Paul's mission is to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations including his Roman audience. And now the reading. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading. for this fourth Sunday of Advent comes to us from Matthew 
the uh, first chapter beginning with the 18th verse. Glory to you, o Lord. The Christmas story is one that has lots of drama in it. It begins, of course, with the Annunciation, when the angel comes to Mary and tells, tells her she's going to have a baby. Of course, she's perplexed by that. <laughs> and now Joseph gets the news that his fiancée is pregnant, and he didn't have anything to do with it. And so he's wondering how to handle the situation when he, like his fiance, gets a visit from an angel. Please join me in the reading of this gospel. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph may be seated.
most, Reverend Robert Runcie, a previous Archbishop of Canterbury, tells of getting on a, a train once in England and discovering that all the other passengers in the car he was seated in were patients at a psychiatric institution being taken on an all-day sightseeing excursion. A hospital attendant was counting the patients in the car to be sure that they were all present and accounted for. One, two, three, four, five. Then he came to Runcie and he said, And who, sir, are you? I am the Archbishop of Canterbury, Runcie replied. The attendant smiled and still pointing to him said, Six, <laughs> seven, eight. Being an archbishop can be a challenging occupation, but when you consider what Joseph went through in becoming the stepfather of Jesus, I think you would have to agree that few jobs in, history, in the history of our faith have been more challenging than Joseph's. In today's gospel, we are told that Joseph was a righteous man. That's not a phrase we use much today. Have you ever wondered what that phrase, righteous person, signifies? There's a rich history behind this phrase. The Hebrew word for a righteous person is sadi. Joseph was a sadik, meaning he was known for his uncompromising obedience to the law. Unlike many people today, who see little connection between their faith and their everyday life, Joseph saw religious ramifications in just about everything he did, from how he woke up to what he ate to what he ha happened when he went to bed at night. Uh, so, in other words, he did not eat unclean foods. He did not keep his carpentry shop open on the Sabbath day to make a few denarii. And he attended the high holy days in Jerusalem, and he memorized the scriptures. So this was a pretty long list of tasks that he was involved in. In fact, the Hebrew scriptures have over 600 different laws that Jews are supposed to take quite seriously. So Joseph was a Sadiq. That was his identity. Everybody knew this about him. No one would have asked him to turn the other way when an injustice had been committed. He was what other people wanted to become, admired and looked up to, even though he didn't have a lot of financial resources. But now, Joseph was in a pickle. The girl he was engaged to is pregnant, and whoever the father is, Joseph knows it's not him. Now there's this is a small town, and as a general rule, word gets around pretty quickly in small towns. So we have a guy who takes his reputation seriously, and a pregnant fiancé in a small village where, as a matter of course, everybody knows everybody else's business. This is a real problem and puts Joseph in a real conundrum. Because we live on the other side of the Christmas story, we want to rush to the end where everything turns out okay. But if you do that, you miss the whole point of what Joseph is learning through this experience and what we too, can learn from him. That there is some amazing stuff going on around the birth of this child that we will come to know as Emmanuel. So I want, to, I want you all to put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a moment. Your fiancé is pregnant, and your entire reputation resolve, revolves around one thing, your commitment to the Torah. What the Torah says you do. That's who you are. So in this particular instance, you actually have only two options. Number one, a very messy public legal proceeding involving charges of immorality and unfaithfulness on Mary's part. And that often would conclude with a stoning. Secondly, a quiet divorce involving two witnesses. The Torah was clear. Joseph's reputation as a Sadiq was on the line. His fellow Sadiqim would have told him this sin must be publicly exposed and punished. But to his credit, Joseph couldn't bring himself to do such a cruel thing to his fiance. If Joseph had been there when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, things might have been a little different. If he had seen the angel and heard the proclamation, he might have thought, okay, 
I'm with you, 100%. But Joseph had not been party to that conversation. And now he feels he has little choice but to end his relationship with Mary. That's when God decides to intervene and do something pretty amazing. While Joseph was sleeping, an angel came to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, don't hesitate to make Mary your bride. Mary's pregnancy is spirit-conceived. God's Holy Spirit has made her pregnant. She will bring forth a son, and when she does, you will name him Jesus, which means God saves, okay, because he will save God's people. This dream creates a second dilemma for Joseph, for if he follows the angel's advice, what's it going to do? Ruin his reputation. Joseph is acutely aware that few of his friends will believe the story about the angel visit, and no one will buy the report of a supernatural conception. Joseph, they will be thinking, is attempting to cover up Mary's big fat miracle story with a pledge to make her his wife. Hardly an auspicious beginning for a promising union. So the question becomes, will Joseph preserve his reputation, or will he do what the angel asks? And we know, of course, that he chooses to do the latter. In his book, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, Donald Miller describes hearing a message from God when he wasn't expecting it, and having that message turn his life completely upside down. He relates that he was driving over the Bybee Bridge in downtown Portland and listening to NPR when a story came on about a man who was reunited with his father, whom he hadn't seen in 20 years. Don listened to the story indifferently, not applying it to his own life, when suddenly a voice, the inner writer that is not you, pounded on the keyboard, broke the pencil on the paper, and was so emphatic that Don had to pull his truck over to the side of the road because the voice, of course, was God's. And the inner voice inside Don told him that he was to look up his own father, whom he hadn't seen in 30 years. Don told the voice, no, but it wouldn't leave him alone. It came to him whenever he passed the Bybee Bridge and when he went to sleep at night and whenever he was running errands. The voice said that he was to find his father and to go and sit across from his father and then tell his father that he forgave him. After a number of fits and false starts, Donald followed through on this assignment from God and an amazing thing took place. Not only was his father healed by their reunion, but Donald himself experienced a coming together of disparate parts of himself he never realized existed. All because Donald said yes to the inner voice speaking to him on the Bybee Bridge. Ever happened to you? Any of you are saying no? <laughs> the dream Joseph had of an angel has a similar effect in his life. It completely changes Joseph's attitude toward his fiance and alters the course of action which he had made up his mind to pursue. Instead of divorcing the woman who he thought had betrayed him, Joseph went and made Mary his wife, following the instructions of the angel just as he had been told. Jill Briscoe has this to say about Joseph's choice. Joseph did an incredible thing. He welcomed the Christ child before the child was even born. While Jesus was being formed in Mary, Joseph made a secure place for the incarnate Son of God to grow up in this world. He welcomed Jesus into an intact, stable family, not a wealthy or prestigious family, but a family bound together by God's care and God's intervention. Dorothy Cantwell Fisher once wrote a story about a physically powerful but intellectually challenged farmhand named Lem, who lived in the Vermont Valley. His mother resented him from the day he was born. She often ridiculed him with harsh and demeaning words, 
Even so, the boy served his mother until the day she died. Lem was the target of village jokes. Then one night, he came upon a huge dog killing some farmer's sheep. Using his bare hands, he subdued the dog and saved the sheep. When morning came, the villagers discovered the dog was really a giant timber wolf. Lem quickly earned the villagers' silent admiration and respect. Later on, an unwed village girl falsely accused Lem of being the father of her baby. And even though he was innocent, he married the girl so the baby would have a father. Unfortunately, the mother died within a, ver within a year, so Lem raised this little girl to adulthood as a single parent. After she was grown and married, her own baby all of a sudden became desperately ill, kind of like all these kids coming down with RSV right now, and Lem sold all his sheep to pay for the baby's medical care. Although quiet and, ar in and inarticulate, Lem, Lem did the responsible thing, and important lives were affected in very significant ways. I don't know about you, but when I think about the faithfulness and compassion of Lem the farmhand, I'm immediately reminded of this carpenter from Nazareth, Joseph, which begs the question, who have been the Josephs in your life? Who have been the quiet, silent types who have given their unfailing support when you were going through a dark and difficult stretch? Of all the people who played pivotal roles in the story of Jesus' birth, J Joseph seems almost invisible. He's not given any important speeches or pronouncements. In fact, he never gets to say a word in any of the Gospels until Jesus becomes a teenager. And even then, the only thing he's recorded as saying is, Jesus, where have you been? But that does not make his role as the earthly father of Jesus any less important. When God puts his hand on an ordinary life and gives it divine purpose, the world better watch out. For something amazing is about to unfold. And that was certainly the case with this carpenter named Joseph. The simple carpenter from Nazareth with a gentle nudge of an angel was given a privilege unlike any other. This was one of the two people God, would, God trusted to raise his son as their own child. Can you imagine having that kind of responsibility? Here's the son of God. Take care of him. And what was the reason God might have allowed this peculiar set of circumstances to unfold? Maybe God decided that Jesus, who would be called a friend of sinners, should be raised in a family that knew firsthand what it felt like to be regarded as second class and illegitimate. Maybe part of why Jesus had a heart for unrespectable people is that he was raised by a father who sacrificed his respectability for his son. And maybe one reason Jesus had compassion on women who were walking scandals is that he knew what it meant to his mother that his father had stuck by her when she was, signal, when she was single and pregnant and in need of protection. Maybe God had a reason for this odd, painful, lonely way to start a family. Maybe God still calls people to be willing to die to reputation and status and comfort for the sake when Joseph made the decision to marry Mary, he thought it was the end of his being known as a righteous Sadiq. He did not know fully that the child he would raise as his own would bring to the human race an entirely new way of thinking about righteousness. That's what we celebrate this Advent as we prepare for the celebration of Jesus' birth. And all God's people said... Let's stand together for the hymn of the day.
As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God, our shepherd, let your spirit move with power throughout the church. Give discernment and wisdom to our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. Take away our fear so that we serve and love, confident that you are guiding us. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our source, awaken us to the beauty of the earth and the marvelous variety of life. Unite humankind in repairing and caring for your creation. Protect creatures and habitats in peril due to rising seas and warming temperatures. God, in your mercy. God, our vision, raise up leaders in every nation who dream of freedom and justice for all people. We pray for the work of international organizations that promote peace and human rights, especially Amnesty International. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our helper, come to the aid of all who cry out to you. Shelter migrants, refugees, and those fleeing war and famine. Bring relief to individuals and families experiencing hunger, homelessness, or impoverishment. Comfort any who are isolated or lonely. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our Emmanuel, you are with us in our life together. We give you thanks for gathering us in worship and fellowship, and remember those we remember those who cannot be present. Watch over those who travel, heal the sick, and speed their recovery, especially Jane Peterson. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At this time, other intercessions can be offered up either silently or out loud. Lord, we pray for those in the path of severe weather who have recently uh, experienced tornadoes and winter storms. Uh, draw near to those who have lost property and loved ones and comfort them with your grace. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of hope, you bring life out of death, and you promise to be our God forever. Shine upon the faithful who now rest in the fulfillment of your promise and bring us also into your blessed reign of peace. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us share together in the prayer our Savior taught. <coughs> our Father, our Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be, be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Kohlberg shares, an angel spoke the word to Mary and then to Joseph, and after hearing that word, they trusted. Shepherds received the same word and hurried to witness the Savior's birth. Peter, filled with courage by the word, left the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. Surprised into joy, two women at the tomb also heard the word and knew their teacher lived again. Jesus came himself in glorious revelation and brought the reassuring word to John. And in these troubled days, our anxious hearts listen for Christ's greeting of arrival and return. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. That's really the invitation of Jesus in this meal, to come and in our relationship with him, be encouraged and strengthened for whatever lies before us, no matter the difficulty or how large uh, whatever this challenge may be. Be not afraid. That's my invitation to you as well as you come forward to receive these gifts today. For the distribution, I invite you to come down the aisle to my right where I'll be waiting with the bread. After receiving the bread, there'll be two identical stations up in the front. Uh, you can choose either station. Uh, in the individual cups are both wine and grape juice. The grape juice 
is the lighter color. If you are uncomfortable coming up, we also do have some bread and individual wafers in the back you can take at your seat. Come, for all is now ready. Thank you. 